This episode is about my journey from working as a designer in architecture to embarking on a unconventional path in YouTube content creation and entrepreneurship. Join me as I reaccount my journey from being a immigrant child from China to attending architecture school twice to starting my career in corporate America and finally to exploring alternative career avenues. Henry Gao, welcome to Entree Architect Podcast. Pleasure to be on here. Oh, this is this is great. I, I can't believe you're here, Henry. I mean, this is something that I've been looking forward to for a while now. Uh, I'm a big fan of the work that you're doing on YouTube, and I wanted to bring you on here and, and share your story with our audience. I'm really, really, really flattered. And it's just an honor to be on here as a, as a guest, and I hope I can bring as much value to your audience uh, in this quick session. Yeah, this this will be fun. If anybody doesn't know, Henry is a San Francisco-based home designer, illustrator, artist, photographer, and he's an online educator, which is where I know him from. I know him from YouTube. Uh, with a passion for helping architects and interior designers elevate their craft, he specializes in empowering individuals to draw better, to design faster, to unleash their creativity using the iPad. So if you're an iPad user, you need to listen up. Uh, his mission is to bridge the gap between tradition and technology, making the transition to a digital workflow seamless and empowering. If you are someone who likes to draw by hand, somebody who loves to sketch, likes the creative process of drawing paper and pen, uh, but you know that you want to move to iPad, you want to move to technology and be able to do some of the things that you can do on paper on an iPad, or maybe even better, um, Henry's the guy that you want to check out for that. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel that talks all about it. Uh, you should definitely go there. It's youtube.com slash Henry Gao. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But Henry, before we jump into any of that, I want to know more about you. I don't really know any of your background. I don't know your story. So I'd love to have you share your origin story. When did you discover your passion for what you do as an architect? And who or what mm -hmm. inspired you to get started? Okay. Um, I'll just get started as far as my, you know, all the way back to my birth, because I think that actually makes sense. Yeah. So I was born in China and uh, we moved to Canada uh, when I was 12. And even much earlier before that, I was exposed to architecture and the building environment by my parents. They initially took me around to architecturally significant sites in China to draw where I would sit in front of a building or a cityscape for, you know, four or five hours, sometimes a whole day. And wow. I used to have this really big, uh, you can't see my hands, but like sketch pad with actual like paper and felt pen. And that was my medium starting at the age of seven or eight. And we would keep this booklet of all the drawings that I've had back then. I don't have the originals, unfortunately, but they scanned it all before they moved to Canada. So I had these booklets from like seven to 10, wow, from 10 that's to great. 12. And every time I go back home, I would just flip through it and, uh, and just see how bad the drawings were back then because I had no <laughs> formal training. It was just my parents sitting with me, kind of cultivating that patience that I now have and um, the observant observation in front of something, just have the ability just to draw what's in front of me without any sort of formal training. So that was the very, very beginning. Yeah. And I think that had a lot to do with my dad wanting to be an architect himself. And I think due to the political climate back, long back in his days, he eventually became an interior designer, but he also had a very, very skillful hand. I think that's where I got my hand from was yeah. uh, was from him. He wanted me to develop a, a good eye for, for drawing, for painting later on. So that continued after we moved to Canada. So when we moved to Canada, I continued my more of a formal artistic pursuit in just the different other mediums uh, with more focus on graphite and oil painting and watercolor. And I actually attended a high school where uh, it was a it was a focus group for very um, I guess talented artistic kids. You had to test to getting. So that was a very from high school. It was a very natural transition to choosing a 
career in architecture because of all this previous exposure to architecture, the built environment, it sounded right at the time. And honestly, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I was really just following what my parents wanted me to do, like a lot of other uh, Asian kids. So I eventually pursued two degrees in architecture, one in Canada for my undergrad and one in the U.S., uh, Cornell in uh, Ithaca for my graduate school, where eventually I chose to move to California to uh, pursue my career or to start my career because I thought this climate was much better than the one I had in Canada. So, and that turned out to be a, a wise decision just for the kind of lifestyle that I have nowadays and the things that I want to do with, you know, being good weather all year round. So having worked in California since 2015 uh, for about six, seven years, I started to pivot into working for myself more. And this is where I had a lot of pursuit in different areas. Uh, you can call them side hustle. So some of them I was doing along with my actual day job. So things like 3D renderings that I did right away after I came out of school. Um, and then I, I tried to open an online Etsy shop where I sold a lot of my travel prints, which was inspired by many years of drawing um, in China. So I still have that shop and it's still ongoing uh, as of today. Also, I wanted to see if I could do some architectural photography, uh, which I still do. And I also practice as an illustrator, which is also goes kind of hand in hand with the, the drawing days. And also there were a lot of cross and overlap with architectural rendering. That's something that I do more of today than the actual 3D renderings. So I would consider these as all these little points that I had connected the dots to what I'm doing most nowadays is actually more online educating where I found a, a, a niche where I had personally transitioned to using the iPad myself in my day job since 2017. And I found a workflow that alleviated a lot of my own pain points as a young designer. So as time went on and I developed a skill set and we find it to a point where uh, people have been asking me to share my tips or to give them one-on-one -on -one training sessions. This is where it kind of coincided with COVID, which at the beginning of COVID, everyone was staying home and I had this extra time to publish some of the knowledge that I had gathered in the two to three years in a online YouTube space. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. And it was really at that time a more of a hobby and a passion project, like any of the side hustles uh, that I had before. It was just something that I wanted to share and I saw it could benefit someone else. Instead of me teaching one-on-one -on -one to many people, I could do it in more of a group setting and reach a broader audience. So the channel grew over time, actually. It grew quickly in the past three years where I have decided to monetize it and pivot my current uh, career trajectory into more of a online teaching business in that space that I found a lot of love and recent passion for. So all of those things that I did in the past culminated to this point in my life, which is actually now looking back at it is kind of cool because if I had skipped any of these things, I might not have found in what I'm doing today. So that's a quick origin story. Hopefully that yeah. Um, give some insight to your audience. That's perfect. That's perfect. The the um, connecting the dots is a very important uh, takeaway from what you just said, right? That that you need to do all of those things to get to where you are today. Um, mm -hmm. I think many people are uh, impatient and they just want to get to that big dream that they have in their mind. Um, mm -hmm. And they they want to just skip all these things, right? That That maybe they're working for an architect and they're just frustrated. They don't want to work for the architect anymore. They just want to do this big dream they have, but they don't realize that the work that they're doing with the architect is giving them lots of knowledge and information and, and motivation to pursue the next step. And so uh, that message of sort of 
recognizing that there are many steps along the way and there are seasons in your life and each one is adding to ultimately where you are today and where you will be in the future, right? That where you are today is not the final step. It's just one of the steps to get to where you ultimately uh, will find yourself in the future. Yeah, I can't agree more. And where I think I'm at today, um, at a tender young age, I think I still have the next 20 years to figure out where I want to be uh, for, for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a very exciting place to be. Um, and I love that you've set up so many, um, you have so many passions and you've, you've monetized many of them, right? You've pursued many and you've monetized many. Um, mm. Are you, are you, so you're now working solely on your own. You, you don't have a full-time employer anymore? Not anymore. That and, came about slowly over the maybe period of two to three years. And even in the very beginning, I just wanted to highlight this. When I was working for a more of a corporate uh, job out, right out of school, I did that for about a year and a half. When I transitioned to work for a smaller firm, I had negotiated a reduced schedule. So most people work five days, 40 hours. I had asked for four day, 32 hours. So I had that extra Friday off every week to do something that I wanted to pursue so at the time, I saw that as maybe this will give me more time to pursue the 3D rendering side hustle. And uh, the reason I thought that was viable was in the first year of working professionally, I had almost made just as much money uh, moonlighting on the side than uh, compared to the salary I was getting paid in my day job. So I, I definitely saw the, the, the promising kind of a... Uh, trajectory if I spend more time on it, though that didn't uh, turn out to be what I wanted. That didn't turn out to be what I ended up doing. But having that white space yeah. allowed me to just think of other things that I could do with it. That's how I came to have uh, the idea of opening a online art store. That's how I how I had time to develop uh, other skill set that I didn't have time before. So I just wanted to mention that because it wasn't a quit my job and do all these other things. Right. It was from a five day to a four day to a three day and then to like a one to two day. And then eventually I decided it was I had enough momentum to keep going on my own. And that was um, that was a very natural step to step away from a full time or even a part time job. Yeah. And, and it was, but it was very intentional, right? So, so when you moved from the big corporate firm to a fir a smaller firm, rather than going to that firm and saying, Hey, I have all this experience, pay me more. You said, I have all this experience. I want to provide value for your firm, but I also, rather than the money, I'd rather have more time. And so exactly. let's focus on the time. And when, that's where mm -hmm. the negotiation will be. That's a great idea. Uh, for other architects who who are in that position where they do want to mm -hmm. sort of pursue other passions, whether they're other businesses or just mm -hmm. uh, creative pursuits that they have that they want more time and the money isn't mm -hmm. as important to them as the time is, um, that's mm -hmm. something that can be negotiated for sure. Right. It's so, not that money wasn't as important to me. Yeah. It was because I, I knew that I could make more money if I had more time. Um, so I think that's important to distinguish. It wasn't like we, we don't need money because I think coming out of school, making 60, 70,000 a year, living in a very expensive city, wasn't going to be, uh, wasn't going to cut it very well for the next five, 10 yeah. years. So I already knew that right away coming out of school. What inspired you to make the move? Cause it was obviously an, an, an intentional move to have your own business and, and pursue all of these passions. Was there something specific that um, that motivated you or inspired you to do that rather than just taking a more traditional route where you just work for an architect and, and grow in that firm and, and traditionally uh, move up through the ranks? What was the motivation to go on your own and pursue these alternative uh, revenue streams? That's a great question and something that I've thought a lot about. I think coming out of school, I didn't have that desire to go off right away or to be an entrepreneur, as you, you would call it nowadays. I had in my mind to pursue the 
traditional, more of a traditional career path, go in the firm, grow with the firm, eventually move up into the leadership position, and perhaps then either quit and open my own firm or just grow to be uh, into a partner. That was what I had in my mind. I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today without all these other little milestones. So it wasn't as intentional as you might describe it. It was more of a take a little by little mm -hmm. and then learn from people outside of the AEC industry. So my exposure to to business and entrepreneurship came very slowly. And it's it's to listening podcasts like yours, to Pat Flynn, a lot of the other sort of online um, entrepreneurs that I slowly thought this could be me as well. So it wasn't a exact science at the very beginning. It was a very slow trigger and I had to, do a lot of mindset shift in order yeah. to to do this because there's a lot of risk associated with being an entrepreneur yes. and uh, be the one making the money, creating the money as opposed to be earning the money, I think. Being an entrepreneur is hard, right? Having your own business mm -hmm. and being responsible for the revenue and the sales that, mm -hmm. that, come, uh, that come through um, is a huge responsibility. And, and it's not as easy as it looks. Right. It's it's, you know, mm -hmm. businesses promote themselves as the best that they can be. Um, and many are very successful, but but it's very difficult to build a business from scratch. And and especially with the type of work that you're doing with online education and the YouTube channel, um, the YouTube YouTube channel takes a long time to build. Right. And so there's patience mm -hmm. involved there and there's and there's determination involved there to make sure mm -hmm. that. Uh, that it does get to where you want it to go because there's lots of opportunities mm -hmm. in that yeah. slow growth to quit because it's hard and it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. and you're not getting the the views maybe that you wanted to and so mm -hmm. can you share a little bit about that the struggle of becoming an entrepreneur and the the, the tough side of of being uh, of doing the things that you're doing? Sure, I think like you said, being on YouTube or start creating videos can take enormous amount of work especially in the beginning where if you don't know what you're doing, right? So there's so many facets to creating a good, compelling video that just takes skill sets from many levels, from you know, writing a good uh, narrative or script, knowing how to use the camera, knowing how to set up your space, knowing how to film, edit, and eventually publish. There's a lot of moving components that can be extremely difficult for a person without a background in any or some of these things. For me personally, a lot of the skill sets that I had before becoming a present on YouTube added to the things that I needed to produce a video. So I, I really knew how to use the camera very well. It was very easy to know how to film. Um, I had to learn how to edit the videos, however, but that wasn't too difficult as I'm somewhat, uh, most people are probably enough computer savvy to learn how to do this. So uh, the skills that I had from the past 10, 15 years, definitely all added to this. And I really believe a lot of architects coming out of school, at least the, in my generation coming out of school are already equipped yes. with many of these skill sets like graphic design, video editing, graphic editing, and uh, setting up these things are, are probably meta skills that a lot of people already have. They might need to develop some other skill sets, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone with an architecture background wanted to pursue this, it would be a lot easier for them to do it than someone who is maybe in a computer science major. Um, that being said, it is incredibly difficult to make a good video and time consuming. So most people who are already working a five day, 40 hour job, 40 hour job, let's be honest, it's not a 40 hour job. It's both, for most people who are ambitious of 50 to 60 hours right. to, to carve the time to make content is going to be an, another part-time job. So for me, because I had these extra eight to 10 hours a week set aside on a Friday, I could do this, but to really 
excel into the space, you do need to put in the time. And if you don't, it's just going to be a very slow trickle. For me, um, my content wasn't viral, but it did grow over time. So I could see the growth very steadily over the next three to four years, even in my year one. So I knew if I kept growing like this, there's a chance that if it grows at this current rate, it would be good. Eventually, one of my videos popped off and that got me a lot more attention than what I thought I would. But in the very beginning, it is, it's going to be slow, but building a business is going to be slow. And if yeah. you can have a, if you can live with how slow it is and build a foundation slowly, I think the likelihood of you creating a lasting business is going to be higher than if something turned out to be an overnight success, which I don't think that exists. Yeah, um, I agree. How exciting was it when that one video popped? The video that popped, ironically, was not intended for what I wanted to share in the very beginning. It was a video that talked about side hustles for architects. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interesting comments in the, in the comment area if you want to check it out. But it definitely was not a video that I wanted to share in terms of teaching drawing on the iPad. Yeah. And that video took a more, took more than a year to really skyrocket. I think the algorithm found it, found the right people. It just kept serving to more and more people. And even to now, it's one of my most viewed videos um, every month. So even though I knew that had, that video garnered a lot of interest, it wasn't something that I wanted to build a business around. Although I'm very passionate about talking about it. As we're talking about this topic today, it's not the area where I wanted to build a business on. Yeah. Maybe someday, but not at the moment. Yeah, I, I um, back to what you were saying about this generation and the next generation, um, being prepared, right. To be a, to coming natively to our profession, to be able to do things like what you're doing. Uh, and I, I agree with you. I, I believe that the, this current generation, and especially the next generation that's coming, um, are, are, are innately in entrepreneurial. I think they come because they are exposed to the internet. They see, uh, young people building businesses from scratch, all types of businesses making lots of money. Um, they've been in, immersed in technology since birth, literally. Um, and so using iPads and iPhones and, and computers are just part of the existence that they have. They've been communicating uh, with their friends on devices since they've been communicating with friends. Uh, and so it is uh, very interesting to me to watch that transition. Um, and it is absolutely going to be a uh, part of the next generation of architects building businesses that are not necessarily traditional architecture businesses. Many of them will continue to build traditional architecture businesses, but I think many, many will uh, evolve and become more than architects uh, and supplement the work that they do as architects, much like what you're doing following other passions, integrating all of them into a single brand uh, and providing services to many different people with the skills that you have. Absolutely. I think there's so much room in the space that I'm in right now. There's very few people that are doing what I'm doing, especially f from like an architectural background. There's maybe a handful of creators that I can bring up that are doing this full time. Uh, there's very few that I know that are just doing this to supplement their income. But I think there's just tremendous amount of room if somebody wanted to step up and take part of that pie, which I really think there's there's more than enough yes. for for anyone. So this is a great business model if um, if anyone is interested in tapping into content and um, and content often times are seen a little negatively, I think, in our industry because of the TikTok generation and uh, the not so good content that our people are putting out um, or the addictive content that people are putting out. But yeah. if you are someone with a particular skill set um, that can truly benefit someone, I think 
start sharing it right now that if you can add value to someone, even if it's like, even if you know something that's 10% more than somebody else and you can help them get to where you are, that is already enough to be serving and creating content online and start building a small asset that you own for however many years that you want to have a career. This is just an incredible thing that I wish I had learned in my architectural school days. I have, I wish yes. I had captured more, documented more, just so that I can share more of that to, to the next generation. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a huge opportunity for architecture students to create content and document their, their process, right? Their journey through architecture school to become an architect. I think there's a huge opportunity there for, for young uh, architecture students. Um, mm -hmm. your, your niche is very interesting. You know, you've, you've landed on through all of the work that you've done. Um, your, your YouTube channel is primarily focused on, um, on using iPad to do hand drawings and to do presentation uh, for architects and specifically, well, architects and interior designers, the built environment uh, design uh, professions. How did you land there, right? Because I'm sure you didn't say, well, I'm gonna create a YouTube channel about I iPad and hand drawing. How did mm -hmm. you land on this topic that now is your primary brand? Mm -hmm. um, good question. And I think the best answer that I can give is, you know, I'm only, I'm trying to help someone that I was seven years ago, exactly. And I'll, I'll, I'll describe my pain point a little bit back then. So, so it's more helpful. So when I came out of school, I, I was very, very proficient with hand drawing. And when I worked for a smaller firm and at a smaller firm, you get to wear a lot of hat and you get to be a designer, which is incredibly rewarding. Not many young people come to school and be the designer um, at the firm. So at the firm that I was in called Red Dot Studio, the, the principal there gave everyone equal opportunities to design their own projects and will come around the table so a lot of times, often when we are huddled around the table, drawing on sketch paper, tracing out our ideas, I, I, I was always known for someone that came out with very nice sketches on, on paper or face value. But when you actually get to transcribe these sketches into more calculated floor plans, one of the things that I found most difficult to do was my stairs were always off, you know, like when you're using a little triangular scale ruler, it's really easy to make mistakes about a foot or two. So what you thought made a lot of sense on paper or what looked good on paper didn't translate well. And I was always um, pinned for having theoretical stairs or spaces, <laughs> uh, but it's in that similar sort of a uh, realm. Yeah. So I wanted, and, and the things that I did always didn't get didn't make it to the presentation if you will so because there were mistakes there were things i needed to edit out or to redo so the time the time started to add up in the editing in the revising that's when i started to have an inkling about is there a better way to do this uh maybe a little bit more non-destructively so i had to look around a lot of a lot of things so i started with a a Wacom tablet, which you might be familiar yep. with because they go back 15 years. And I had bought a $2,500 Wacom tablet that I thought was the was the solution or the savior to just, my problem. Just for and anybody who up. doesn't know, it's a it's a it's basically a black pad that sits on your desk and you have a, mm -hmm. a cursor that looks like a pen and you can draw on the, the tablet and it converts to the to the computer screen. Right. But the version I got was even fancier. It was actually, I'm drawing on the screen, looking wow. at the drawing. You got the advanced one. So, but that, I got a nice one. And that was like 25 inches big. It had to be hooked up to my computer. I had to lug it over, everywhere. And it was just a pain in the butt to, so be, it was like a giant to iPad. be tethered. It was a giant iPad. It wasn't smart. It just, yep. it was a big screen with a nice pen. So that was my first dabble into digital drawing with Photoshop. While that worked, I had figured out a system that worked. It was not very portable. It wasn't convenient. And that's when the iPad rolled out, I think 2015 or 2016 with the Apple Pencil. And I thought, let me give this other thing a try and just see if I like it or not. If I don't, I'll return it. 
And the moment I bought it, I realized this, this, this is the next big thing. And at the time, I looked everywhere on online for tutorials, instructional videos on not how to just use the iPad, but like other specific softwares for architects and interior designers. And I found none, which made sense because that was such a new tool. Right. And the apps that were designed for um, the iPad wasn't widely used by designers. They were more for animators, graphic designers, or people that you know like to draw. So I basically had to figure it out my own system. So that took a long time to figure out a set of workflow templates that are that I think I've designed it for architectural use, and I realized interior designers might as well use it because it's so similar. So things like scale templates, rulers brushes, different kind of um, furniture templates, people, vegetation, trees. These are the things that I personally consider would save me a lot of time. I started to share that with Office and uh, eventually online. And this is a free resource that I give out to anyone that goes on my website to download it. So to me, having this ability to revise, edit, and just iterate your design without using the traditional pen and pencil just was extremely efficient and made this traditional process much more streamlined because I didn't need to go to a scanner anymore. I didn't need to live or work beside a scanner with a with multiple, you know, different size trace paper that you have to piece together and stitch together into a yeah. <laughs> into a bigger floor plan. I think most people can relate to that. And then I didn't need to go into Photoshop to, you know, make the paper white or to edit out the, the, the lines that were mistakenly drawn, I could just do that right on the iPad. And the best thing is saving that is and issuing that as a file to anyone or printing it out. It's just like, you know, click of a button. So that was my first uh, kind of uh, intuition that this was gonna be a big thing for designers around the world. If more people can see, can just see what this amazing tool can do. So what, what software are you using today? You started with the native iPad software. What, what software are you training with today and, and using mostly today? I personally use a software, two software actually. One is called Procreate and the other one is called Morfolio Trace. Uh, I think they both have big portion of the market share. So I think if new, anyone's looking up um, iPad software for architects, they will inevitably come across these two big players in uh, in the industry. Do you have a preference over one or the other or does or, or does one have a strength that the other one doesn't? Right. So Procre is a software that's designed for graphic designers and animators. And uh, I think personally it has it it, it it's kind of more like Photoshop. It has more of a Photoshop like tool set and you can create more prettier watercolor or Copic marker look and the traditional felt pen look. So a lot of the illustration, the prettier marketing images that I do are all from Procreate. Where Morfolio Trace shines is, it's actually designed by a group of architects who maybe got tired of working for other architects. <laughs> had, a, to, had a side gig. Uh, <laughs> had a side job. <laughs> and now it's, it's become this widely known uh, app that does scale work extremely well. That you can take it to site visits. You can redline, annotate. You can you can draw also as 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 well, but not as well as Procreate. So you can do a lot of the everyday things for what an architect might need. But if you wanted to take it to the next level of illustration, Procreate is what I personally go to. Portfolio Trace is really for practicing architects that maybe need to read PDFs, they need to redline, they need to do scale work, um, things like that, because it is specifically designed for the AEC industry. And can you go back and forth? Can you create something in Procreate and then import it into Morfolio? Uh, there's a little bit of overlap between the two. They're not very native mm -hmm. um, in terms of file sharing, you can. I, I do teach a workflow how to say bring a file that you generated from a folio trace and you can color it in Procreate, but it's not very native. So there's a little bit of workaround, um, but it hasn't been a issue for me. So on 
on most of my weekly basis, I'll, I'll, I'll juggle between the two. And I think having, having both by now using it for their strength is definitely worth investing in, in both app. So before we're getting to the end here, so before we wrap up and before I ask you my final question, I want to talk a little bit more about the actual program that you offer. Um, who is okay. your target student and, and what type of program are you presenting? My targeted audience, interesting enough, are not students, they are professionals. So these are 25 to 50 year olds. And I can tell that from the purchase history of students, where they come from. And I personally believe these are professionals because they are seeing this as a tool that can save them a lot of time over time. Um, so they're using it for professional in professional settings. So in firms, in small businesses, and less for hobbyists or for students that are, you know, students in school, that are still trying to learn all these other softwares on the computer. So they're less invested into hand drawing, but people that are in, in maybe a little, just one generation above me, they still value hand drawing as a important tool set to have or someone who is really good at hand drawing, they just wanted to elevate it into drawing digitally. This is for them. And this is also for people that goes on site a lot, that takes notes, that want to measure their drawing and transcribe their drawing afterwards. This is really for practicing professionals. And, and uh, information for that is on the website, henry henrygao.com? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I could imagine, you know, if, if you're out there and you you have that iPad sitting around, right? You bought the iPad Pro and it's got the pencil and you're like, I just, I love this thing. I just don't know how to use it for work. I'd love to be able to use it every day for work, um, do some sketches, create a workflow. I think that's exactly what Henry's doing on his YouTube channel and in his programs. Uh, you should go check it out. He's on YouTube at youtube.com slash Henry Gao. The website is henrygao.com. Um, and you could reach him there and, and say hi, ask any questions that you might have. Um, Henry, before we wrap up here, uh, I'd love for you to share your thoughts uh, on the question that I ask all my guests. Um, what's one thing that a small firm architect can do today to build a better business for tomorrow? Um, if I'm not in that position personally, per se, uh, but if I were in that position, one thing that I would start doing based on my experience is to really build a online presence. And that's not to say you have to build yourself as an influencer, but just to build authority around the area that you personally excel in or you have knowledge to share. Because I think a lot of knowledge, um, for architects are kind of hoarded among us and they're not easily shared to you know, your ultimate clients to them, what will help them most is to, 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 to know who you are before they even meet you. So what that means is, you know, can you build something, especially with video format so that they can like trust and know you before they even have their first physical or zoom interaction with you. And that's personally being my case, although I did not build my online business to serve um, our architectural clients like homeowners, I've had a lot of inquiries as the result of having an online presence. I had a lot of inquiries on whether I would be interested in doing someone's project or, or remodel their house. And I assume that's primarily because they've already seen my content. They've already heard from me. They know what I look like, what I sound like. I have already had this small authority in making them feel comfortable in reaching out. So when they do reach out, it's less of a, are you the right person for me? It's more of a, how can we work together and find the right way to, you know, to, to build their home. So I think that to me is, is something that any small owner can do. And uh, with all these digital platform medias, it doesn't have to be YouTube. It could be very value driven content for TikTok, Instagram, but I think this is something that I personally would recommend to, to small business owners. Yeah, that's great advice. His name is Henry Gao. 
Again, you can find more about Henry and all the work that he does at henrygao.com. It's G-A-O, though, so it's henrygao.com. Um, the YouTube channel is the same, Henry Gao. Go check him out. Also, um, you mentioned earlier in our conversation, Henry, uh, about your free resources. Can you share a little bit more about what you have there for people? Because it's easy. Just go there, hit the button, you can download it. What What do you have over there right. for them? So the free resources are uh, located on my website. So it's henrygao.com. And then there is a tab called Teaching. And under the Teaching tab, you'll find all the free resources that I have for Procreate, which I think is the, the baseline that anyone should start learning. So there I have a three-part workshop that are designed for architects, interior designers, and I have lots of templates, brush sets, color palettes, tree, vegetation. These are the things that I personally have spent a lot of time creating for myself so I can save time. So I think this is a great starting point to anyone that has an iPad. And to me, most people around me has have an iPad. Yeah. They're just not using it right. professionally, which which s doesn't surprise me, but also surprise me at the same time. Because it's not a it's not a problem of not having the device. It's more just using it professionally. Yeah. Yeah. It's a missed opportunity if you're not using your iPad in the work that you're doing, right? If you have the iPad and you can, you know, you can use it for sketching, you can use it for drawing, communicating. Uh, it's a great tool for us as architects. And so Henry's a great resource for you. You should go check him out. Uh, Henry, thank you. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Thank you for creating the YouTube channel and sharing your knowledge over there, helping architects learn how to use an iPad to be more effective as architects. Um, it's an important uh, role that you play and I'm glad that you're there. And I appreciate you for coming by here and sharing your knowledge, your story, uh, and all the things that you're doing, uh, inspiring us here today at Entree Architect Podcast. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you having me on here. And honestly, I didn't think I could be as concise as I could. Um, I thought I would be a lot, I have a lot more things to say, but you asked great questions and kept it very succinct. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you for being here. Thank you.